Good afternoon and welcome to the 2023 IHF Coaches and Referees Education Week. We're leading experts throughout the world of handball, share their knowledge and experience in the next seven days. My name is Adrian Costello. I'm a member of the IHF media team, and I will be your host throughout the next week for 12 um, interesting webinars. This is the last one, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, to begin with, we would like to let you know that these sessions will be in English, but outline that we have translations available in French, Spanish, and Arabic. These are simply at one click away. You need to click the globe icon, the interpretation icon, and choose the preferred uh, language. All of the webinars are um, being uh, available on demand at ihfeducation.ihf.info in the IHF Education Center. For the last webinar of uh, this um, uh, IHF Coaches and Referees Education Week, we have uh, with us Johan Beppler, an IHF lecturer and uh, the assistant coach of, of the Germany Women's Senior National Team. Uh, the presentation will be isolation spaces for successful one-on-one -on -one duels and possible follow-up actions. Johan, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours now. Adrian, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, let me quickly share my screen with you so uh, that everything is ready. Um, this will sh shortly be the case. Yes, and now I think everything is working. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to finish these uh, online education weeks after uh, so many great lecturers from all around the world have shared their knowledge. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to do this today before in the in the upcoming week, we start with a um, junior world championships uh, with uh, all the tournaments in the summer where we uh, are keen to see how handball is developing uh, throughout the summer. Um, let me quickly try to connect today's presentation to some of my fellow colleagues. Um, uh, for example, today's topic is strongly connected to new ways and approaches of detecting talents, uh, which Klaus Hansen was speaking about. And I think it's also necessary for the goalkeepers and why the demands for um, goalkeepers are increasing so much, like uh, Mats Olson told you. And not to forget also the referees uh, who have to decide in one-on-one uh, -on -one duels if there are any attacker mistakes like steps or offensive fouls, but also um, if the defender has to be punished by uh, suspension or um, other ways of progression. Yeah, so this um, topic is connected, as I said, and here you can see today's agenda with uh, six uh, chapters. Uh, after uh, the 25 first slides, there will be a short break uh, where you can um, uh, address questions to me, and I'm uh, willing and trying to, to answer them, and there the hosts of IHF will help me. Yeah, and after a look at the agenda, let us quickly come um, to a common understanding of what we mean exactly when we are speaking of an isolation. And uh, I tried for my presentation of today uh, to choose an approach to make use of pictures and videos to convey my thoughts and message instead of using many slides with a lot of text. So I'm uh, trying to follow the proverb, a picture is worth a thousand words. And uh, yeah, at some places I will also try to make use of uh, videos. Whenever I use videos, I have provided you with uh, some QR codes uh, so that uh, you can follow and watch the videos on your mobile devices in case there are any internet uh, problems. So, Back to uh, the question uh, for the first chapter, what is an isolation? I provided the following uh, video for you. It's taken of the Olympic Games 2021, Egypt against Denmark. And uh, here's uh, the, the clip as well. So you can watch the clip uh, during my presentation or on your mobile device.
Yeah, what I like about this uh, video is that uh, two different perspectives are shown. And uh, this video um, was taken from me in order to describe uh, what I understand of an isolation. And I want to share my thoughts with you uh, with some pictures taken out of this video clip. So in the first picture, you can see that uh, Mats Menza of the um, uh, current world champion Denmark is receiving a pass by Jakob Holm. And he has a long run up, a long way until uh, he reaches his final position. So a long run up means um, he, he can increase speed and arrives at uh, the goal area with um, high dynamic. On the other hand, uh, we can see the defense uh, of Egypt, El Dera and El Masri. They are both covering um, the Danish uh, line player. And so they are still able to cooperate. They, they are able to communicate who is going uh, to defend whom. Uh, they are able uh, to help each other, which will um, change immediately. In the second picture, we see a change of rhythm and speed in the movement of Metz Menza. And we also see that the line player is moving away and that the Egyptian defender, El Dera, uh, will have to follow him, which will increase uh, the area and the space for El Masri to defend Metz Menza. And uh, the defense will no longer be able to, uh, to cooperate properly. So here we see... Uh, uh, the picture, it's clear that El Masri will have to defend Mats Menza, who is coming with great speed. Uh, the line player is uh, no longer between the two central defenders. And uh, that is why uh, El Masri is not really prepared to, to play this one-on-one -on -one duel, which is uh, the advantage the offense wants to reach. So Mats Menza comes with high speed, as already mentioned, and he is able to decide whether he can take a shot, play the one-on-one, -on -one, or maybe having a cooperation with the line player or his two mates in the backcourt. So here we see uh, he arrives in uh, close to the goal area with high speed and takes uh, a quick step shot uh, to finish his action successfully. So, and from this perspective, we do not really see that the space El Masri has to defend is really, really big and is a large space for uh, the central sector. But um, as I said, uh, the video is provided from two different perspectives. And so we will have a look at the same, um, uh, same clip and the same play. Uh, from a different perspective, and you will see that uh, El Masri really has to defend a large space. So here is um, the same action taken from uh, this perspective, the long run-up by Metz Menza. The defenders are um, still able to cooperate because uh, they are connected, they can um, talk to each other, whether they have to switch or who is covering the line player and who is covering uh, Mats Menza. But with the bouncing of Menza and um, the moving away of um, the line player, this changes. So we have the change of rhythm and the line player moving away. And so um, Mats Menza is uh, going to take a one-on-one -on -one action against a defender who is not really uh, uh, prepared um, to lead this one-on-one -on -one duel to his conditions. And in this picture, we can see the large space that um, El Masri is really isolated, which gives uh, the attack a big advantage. So, and then again, um, we have the different options for the attacker who plays the one-on-one, -on -one, the shot, the one-on-one, -on -one, or uh, the cooperation as a possible follow-up action. So you can um, also uh, look at this um, in, in a theoretical way. Uh, first of all, we have the central sector covered with two 
uh, attack players and two players from the defense. But then after the line player has moved away, we have a clear um, uh, one-on-one duel in a central sector, in a large space, um, which gives advantages to the attack. So this was just meant uh, to give you um, also uh, a theoretical a view at, at this uh, situation, not only by the pictures or the clip provided. So let us sum up. What are characteristic features for an isolation? Uh, key elements, characteristics, and so on. Uh, isolations take place in a large space. The larger, the better. The defense ca can't or the defense can hardly cooperate, especially uh, helping and decision-making if um, a defender should help or if he shouldn't help is really difficult to take. The one-on-one -on -one often takes place with an advantage for the attacker because uh, he is running up with uh, high speed and has a huge dynamic. The defender reacts out of a defensive position because uh, only some seconds before, some, some parts of a second before, the line player or a wing player was standing in his sector, keeping him in a defensive position. Um, sometimes, as we will see in this presentation as well, the target sector or the duel is also hidden for a long time by different means in attack. So some camouflage actions um, so that the defense cannot really anticipate uh, where the one-on-one, -on -one, where the isolation will take place. And as we have dealt with uh, the topic in um, the last education weeks before, and also the referees have done uh, yesterday, um, the importance of the line player has pretty much increased and they afford good skills in one-on-one -on -one actions and in technique like uh, catching, receiving the ball, making feints, and so on. So from my point of view, these uh, six bullet points are um, uh, characteristic features for isolations. Yeah, we can also sum up this um, in a picture. We have a long run up for the attacker so that the defender is not prepared and the speed is high. A moving uh, pivot or line player destroys the possibility for the defense to cooperate. The defender reacts lately and from a defensive position. We have a large space um, for uh, the attack. And sometimes camouflage actions um, uh, keep it as a secret where the one-on-one -on -one will take place and um, which constellation will lead to the one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, sometimes we do not really know who is the go-to guy in the offense and um, which defender will be attacked in the one-on-one -on -one situation. So um, those online education weeks uh, are pretty much helpful from my point of view also to have a look at the game itself and how the evolution of handball is going on. And uh, the evolution does not only occur and take place in handball, but also in other team sports, as um, I want to try to show you. Um, for example, you can see this heat map of basketball uh, with the top 200 shot locations in the NBA compared uh, of the season 2001 and 2002 with the season 2019 and 2020. Um, it's uh, pretty clear which, which uh, changes have taken place. And um, this was inspiring me to look at a heat map of handball. And I tried to do this uh, comparing some tournaments, some statistics in handball. And uh, I also created a heat map which looks like this. On the left side, you see the statistics. I did not go back that far into the beginning of the 21st century, but uh, I took the European Championships 2014 and had a look where um, 
the most goals were scored from. You see many goals from the backcourt, more than a half. Um, line player, 23, and wings, 24%. On the right side, uh, this is the graphics depending or um, uh, correlating to the World Championships 2023 um, with uh, a huge change um, at the line player position. So uh, from the line, 50% uh, of all the goals were scored. So um, what, is, what is important uh, with those statistics is that it is not only the line player itself, who scores those 50% of all the goals, but also backcourt players uh, at this position. Because with isolating spaces, they create situations for breakthroughs and score in an area where normally only uh, line players have scored goals. So this is um, important uh, to keep in mind and to interpret uh, those figures. So... We can also have a look at uh, the statistics from uh, the Olympic Games starting in 2004, um, going until 2021 in Tokyo, where we can compare different, um, uh, different categories of handball uh, to prove the evolution of this game. First of all, we can say if we take a look at the goals and the shots, that the need for efficiency has increased a lot. And all of us know that efficiency rises the closer you get to the goal. So uh, from 2004 to 2021, we have an uh, increase by 11% or 10.5% in uh, shooting efficiency. Um, the shooting efficiency... Uh, from the six meter area, from the goal area has stayed the same with 63.8%. But if uh, when we take a look at the total shots taking from this position, we see that more goals are scored from there. Uh, uh, and the correct number is uh, 321 goals. Um, the, the next category I want to... Um, uh, focus on is the category of breakthroughs. Uh, here we have an increase in efficiency and in total shots. So the efficiency and breakthroughs um, increased by 7% and also the total um, amount of goals scored um, by breakthroughs has almost doubled up to 130 goals. So uh, these statistics uh, might underline the importance uh, of uh, isolations because we get closer to the goal area, we have more breakthroughs, and um, uh, we can we can see this as a, a result of the heat map I have just shown to you. So this was the introduction, um, what I understand of isolations, and um, the next. Uh, point on the agenda is a structure of isolations be before we have that short break uh, where I can answer uh, questions which might have arised already. So let us look on um, the structure of isolations. Um, from my point of view, uh, from my point of view, there are two possible ways um, of giving isolations something like a unique structure. The first approach is depending on the focus. Um, maybe your focus is the question, which defender you want to attack? Do you prefer central or half defenders in a 6-0 defense, for example? So uh, first focus, which defender do you want to attack? Um, or you have analyzed your uh, opponent um, in detail and you already know where are strengths and weaknesses of your opponent. Another focus might be um, on depending on your team. Uh, what is your uh, who is your specialist for duels or quick decisions? 
who is your go-to guy? So, um, uh, which of your players do you want to put into a one-on-one -on -one duel? And third approach, how do you hide important information? Do you have different openings for um, an isolation? Or do you have a general opening with variations? Um, do you uh, uh, choose to, to uh, different openings to hide or to create the personal constellation uh, for the isolation? So these are important questions uh, in order to find uh, an approach um, leading to a strategy in using isolations. A second uh, approach might depend on your openings. And um, this is what I prefer uh, from my point of view. And uh, I wanted to give you an example how this might look like and how I structured also the upcoming videos. So everything uh, starts with an opening action. And those opening actions are in uh, the golden boxes. So you all know opening actions like uh, crossing in the backcourt without a ball. You know the crossing of center back and the pivot. Uh, you know transition of wings, maybe also with retransitions. You know uh, those openings, Mets Mensa also used, which look like uh, a long crossing, like left back is playing a cross for right back. Uh, it looks only like a long cross, but it is not uh, really played this, this long crossing. Then uh, we know those shifting movements of backcourt players, like they are shifting to one side and creating large space on the other one. And every one of us knows uh, those openings like two against two in the central sector. So these opening actions could hide the target sector where the isolation should take place. And those opening actions might also help to create the personal constellation in which we put our favorite and um, uh, best player for one-on-one -on -one duels in the sector, he should attack uh, the defense. After that, um, after the decision which opening you choose, um, we, we uh, ask ourselves, who do we want to attack? The central defenders, number three and four, or the half defenders? Uh, on position two and five. We also have different pivot actions um, that the pivot could move away or that he's only faking to move away but is coming back or he can move away and put a block to the outside of um, um, a central defender, for example. And then last step, which makes it more tricky uh, for the opponent, uh, we have some variations and fakes, like a fake retransition or uh, a fake isolation. Everything looks um, like a one-on-one, -on -one, but we create a two against two on a large space. I will show you uh, one example to this um, in the upcoming uh, clips and slides. So, um, so far to the theory and approaches on how uh, you can structure isolations. And this would be the first uh, possibility to have some questions uh, at this place for a short break. Adrian. Yes, Johan. One question. Uh, how do you think player development has changed in the last uh, years? Um, with if, you've, uh, you've said that uh, the goals are coming from uh, closer to the, to the line on the six meters. So how did the player uh, profiles change over the last years? Um, as I said, I think, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you. Uh, um, as I said, I think this topic is strongly connected to uh, detecting players and uh, the, the profile of players. Um, for example, I guess 20 years ago, um, players like Matthias Gitzel, um, um, would, yeah, would not have been in the squad in uh, such a high number because everyone would have looked for uh, players who were able to score from uh, nine meters or even further away, like uh, being really tall, having um, 
um, good opportunities to shoot from uh, the outside positions. And now the profiles of players, um, it has changed that they have to be quicker in decision taking, uh, more precise in using uh, even little space to win one-on-one -on -one duels and uh, create break th breakthroughs uh, so that uh, only tall players um, are not required, but uh, a squad needs a good mixture uh, of people and, and players, uh, some who are specialists uh, still to shoot from the outside to create space for the line players, but also those uh, who are able to play one-on-one uh, -on -one duels. So you Thank you, Johan. You can, now, you can now continue your presentation. Thanks. Yeah. Um, after uh, this, this short break and this introduction uh, with some ideas how to describe and characterize isolations, and yeah, looking at isolations from a greater distance in order to, to detect a common or general structure. Let's look how this occurs in top handball. Therefore, I took the finals of the Men's World Championship 2023 and also the Women's World Championship 2021 in Spain. And I took one uh, picture row of every participant. Um, First of all, you have the QR code again with the first example of uh, France, and they choose as an opening a crossing with a line player and try to isolate number three defender. Here's the video for those who cannot watch on their mobile device. <laughs> With a line, okay, four buttons, fouled in the act of shooting, and Zuri Ergeson seems to be saying, I was so close to being good defending. Zadi, the way into the 20 roll, but so the defender is inside. So, a nice clip to start with. And uh, again, I've taken uh, the whole clip in two pictures um, to focus on different actions. You can see the pictures one to four and um, the picture row will last a bit longer. And I try to help you in focusing on some points by um, some boxes I, I create. So we see uh, France attacking Tamara Horacek, uh, Poletta Foppa and Krasadi uh, against Marin Adol and Kari Pratzet in the Norwegian defense on positions three and four. Um, here we can see uh, the crossing center back with the line player and the line player moving um, to the position uh, four and five after this crossing. Now we are in the pictures five to eight. And yeah, let me um, put the first focus on picture number six, where we see uh, Poletta Foppa passes to uh, Hugo La. Uh, on right back in the French team. And here we uh, it, it could be slightly better that he that she really gets into the position between the two defenders, but they are really closing the space so that she cannot uh, block one of them or um, uh, separate them. Uh, and that is why Ugola passes back to Grassadi, who is now on the central back position and everyone knows that she is a good one-on-one -on -one player. So this uh, opening created uh, the personal constellation that Krasadi is now able to attack um, the number three defender, Kari Pratzet. So um, Krasadi is once again passing in picture nine to Tamara Horacek on uh, left back, and she is helping her She's even opening more space, moving um, just to the end of the field. And so she creates a large space um, for that one-on-one -on -one of Krasadi. You can see this in picture 10. She's moving to the outside, taking uh, the half defender with her. And so uh, we have that characteristic feature of large space. And in picture 11, 
you can see uh, the other characteristic feature Krasadi is able to receive this this pass with a long run run up she's increasing uh, speed and uh, therefore gets into this one on one uh, with a with an advantage so the last pictures of this row um uh, Maren Adol, uh, the defender on uh, position number four, she is observing this one-on-one -on -one because she is the one who has to decide if Kari Pratzet needs help. This offers uh, an opportunity for the line player, Poletta Foppa of France, um, to, to run into the position uh, behind uh, Kari Pratzet and giving uh, Krasadi also the possibility to go to um the, to the to her strong side because Maren Adol has to follow her and this is what we see in picture 15 and 16 and now it's only only in uh, quotation marks that Krasadi has to take the right decision either to have a breakthrough or uh, playing to Ugo, Ugo La on right back um, and as we have already seen the clip, we know that she decides for a cooperation with Poletta Foppa, um, who is then uh, finishing this opening action and this isolation of number three defender. So this was the first uh, clip and the first picture row. And now let's move on to the second example taken out of this women's final. Norway, they choose a different opening, crossing without the ball. And uh, as a follow-up action, uh, a second cross, and then they isolate number four defender. Let's take a look at the clip. Well, quarter final against Sweden, which they won 31-26. Way of mostly been on song in attack. Ah, oh, straight through. A uh, very nice clip, and uh, as I said, a different opening uh, to create the personal constellation to hide the target sector. And uh, we are looking at this um, clip again in the picture row. On uh, the first picture, you can already see that. Um, uh, Stina Oftedal and Nora Merck are playing this crossing without the ball. And we have the line player in position uh, four and five. Um, yeah, which helps uh, to, to have the defenders, Horacek and Nokandi, in a defensive position. So. Then, um, as I said, Nora Merck is receiving the ball by Henny Reistadt. And after this crossing without the ball, she is increasing speed, um, is playing with a high dynamic. And as a left-handed player, she is also able to play uh, the cross as a following up action and can um, keep the ball safe because uh, the ball is away from uh, the defender. And then she's playing this cross with Henny Reistadt. And we can see in picture A that we have two separated two against two situations. Um, so we have divided the six uh, zero defense. And uh, yeah, so that is a, a step to, uh, to increase space, to have large space for the upcoming one-on-one -on -one duel. We can all also see uh, in picture eight that the line player is now moving away and isolating Tamara Horacek on number four position in defense. So when uh, she's moving away, Tamara Horacek knows she is now on her own in that one-on-one -on -one situation against uh, Stina Oftedal, who is coming with high speed again, a long run-up, run and uh, the line player is moving away. And so we have good conditions for Stina Oftedal for this one-on-one -on -one action. 
the duel takes place at the nine meter line. This is also relevant for the referees. As I also said, they should also know about the game uh, because if uh, duels take place in this offensive position, you have to have a good perspective if um, the attacker is hit in the face, if she is uh, doing steps uh, and so on. We all know that Stina Oftedal is uh, one of the best one-on-one -on -one players for this uh, duel. So she is winning this uh, duel to her strong side and is able to score this goal in the central sector uh, with a breakthrough, so with the highest probability of success. We also see that the uh, French defender is uh, too far away to be a good help for Tamara Horacek. And even uh, if she had helped, uh, Oftedal would still have had the, the opportunity to play a pass to the line player. So now let's move on to the men's final of um, 2023, France against Denmark. And we'll start with Denmark uh, crossing without the ball and isolation of number three defender. Here's the QR code, and let's have a look at the clip now. Where matches here, Denmark is just a draw against Croatia, otherwise, all wins. Bruno is through Gisel. Goal number five. The Fuchs Berlin right back. Well, that was some fairly uncompromising defending. I like this uh, clip so much because there's so much in it. First of all, we see that there is not that much space in which uh, the players have to take decisions. Then we see that uh, the target sector of the one-on-one -on -one is hidden because not only uh, Saugstrup as a line player is in the center, but also uh, the left wing Magnus Landin is uh, close to the goal area so that uh, the French defense uh, does not really know in which sector maybe a one-on-one -on -one is going to take place. And then I also like this situation uh, because of the following up actions where the referees have to decide if there is an offensive foul occurring and so on. So a high density of um, precise actions and this makes handball so fascinating from my point of view. Uh, and again, let's look at this situation in a picture row. Uh, we have to change the perspective because the pictures are taken um, from uh, the other side. But uh, already in the first pictures, we uh, in the first picture we can see the relevant players like uh, Simon Pitlick and Rasmus Lauge, uh, Matthias Gitzel in the backcourt of Denmark, Magnus Saugstrup um, as a pivot, and Magnus Landin as a left wing, who's also inside, as I've already mentioned. And then we can see um, the French defense with um, on position two, Dika Mem, Luka Karabatic, Gribil, and uh, also Elohim Brandi on position number five. So in picture one, the crossing without the ball is taking place. And as I, all, as I already said, Magnus Landin is also at the goal area. So we don't know if after this crossing, there might be a pass back to Pütlik and Landin moving away and Dika Mem is maybe attacked. Um, so this is, uh, um, as, I, as I said, depending on your approach, how much do you use as camouflage actions uh, to hide the target sector? Uh, the second possible sector for uh, an isolation is in the center with Magnus Saugstrup. And then after uh, the crossing without the ball, uh, Rasmus Lauge is passing once again back to uh, Pütlik in picture number five. Pütlik is also um, close to uh, the outside area to create as much space as possible for Rasmus Lauge. In picture five, we see the most common uh, supporting movement of line players. 
Rasmus Lauge moving away. And so we know that uh, the one-on-one -on -one action is played on Luka Karabatic. We see again the long run-up to increase speed to get a good um, start for that one-on-one -on -one duel. And as Karabatic is moving um, closer to the nine meter line to um, say hello to Rasmus Lauge, uh, Magnus Saugstrup is moving back into the center. So something like a fake movement, as I said in the structure, you can see this in uh, picture seven. And what I also like about uh, these pictures is that Karabatic is following and observing Rasmus Lauge in a, very, in a very detailed way. And Rasmus Lauge is also making use of a passing feint, um, which causes a reaction by Karabatic. You can see this in uh, pictures nine and 10. Karabatic is taking his hands up because Rasmus Lauge is making this movement. So pay attention to those uh, small but very important details. Um, yeah, and this uh, causes Karabatic to go back because he is uh, anticipating this pass to um, Magnus Saugstrup. And what I also like in picture 11, you can see this uh, Saugstrup ready to receive the ball with his right hand showing. Uh, you can also uh, play the pass uh, through Karabatic's uh, legs. So pretty much details in this picture row, um, which shows that uh, in the education of players uh, in the younger age categories, we have so many things to do to provide them for top level in handball. So then the row goes on, picture row goes on. Lauge is making uh, this feint of a jump shot, uh, causes Kribil to act in a block on uh, picture 14. And he is only pretending to do this jump shot and then going on and preparing the breakthrough for Matthias Gitzel, who can increase speed in a very short distance and make use of that small space to have this breakthrough and finish this attack successfully. So this was Denmark in the men's final. And now let's have a look at France in the same final. They chose uh, a different approach to open their uh, attack, uh, as I called it, shifting movements. Um, and here, an isolation of number three defender. Let's have a look at the clip. to play now against France. On the oh yes, brilliant play, took in two defenders with him, left the door wide open behind Remini's fourth goal. Denmark tried to press for a quick throw off. Well, they got the extra player, but doesn't come off. Look at that, two defenders, and there was clear passage. Yeah, again, a very interesting clip because we see at the last uh, picture where the clip stopped, that um, France was short-handed and playing with a sixth attacker in offense. And so they were looking to have a shot and uh, a finish of their attack uh, far away from their bench to give other players um, the possibility to change on, to substitute on a, a short way. So um, if you want to look at it once again, uh, this is not only special because of the isolation, uh, but also... Um, from the perspective or from the point of view, what you can do when you are shorthanded and play with a sixth um, player. That's the play now against France. On the oh yes, brilliant play. Took in two defenders with him, left the door wide open behind Remini's fourth goal. Denmark tried to press for a quick throw off. Well, they got the extra player, but doesn't come off. Look at that, two defenders, and there was clear passage. Yeah, and then we saw Valentin Port did the substitution, and Richardson is now in defense. 
Again, from a different perspective, the picture row connected to this clip. Um, and as I said, uh, we have uh, a shifting movement because we have the line player, um, Luka Karabatic, between players, uh, defenders number one and two. And then we have in the backcourt uh, Richardson, Remili, and Prandi. Um, if you remember Elohim Prandi, um, he was uh, very successful in his younger age categories, uh, years, and also a very important player for France um, in the times of being a junior. Uh, very special about this situation is also uh, the situation that France is playing with two left-handed uh, players, Richardson and uh, Remy Lee. And this is important for the following up action of the one-on-one -on -one of Brandy because he's able to cross, to cross with uh, Remy Lee. Uh, and he as a left-handed player has an advantage because he can go to his uh, strong side. So first picture, we see... Uh, Richardson uh, also opening space by uh, taking away defender number five, Rasmus Lauge, and opening space for Remili, who's receiving the ball, um, but he's not uh, running towards the goal. He's uh, still standing or walking. So uh, this means he's not going to play the one on one action, but the one on one action is going to be played by Elohim Brandi. Uh, Saugstrup is um, uh, not able to go out of the nine meter area because uh, still the line player could move into this area and receive the ball, the ball by Remy Lee or Richardson. And that is why um, he can um, go out uh, a bit later only. And so Prondi can have the long run up and start the one on one action against uh, Saugstrup who is now waiting for him at uh, the 10, 10 meter area, something around that. We see the change of rhythm uh, with uh, Prandi, and we can also see the large space and uh, that uh, those isolations are really hard to defend for central defenders. And it's also hard for their teammates next to them to take decisions in defense as well, whether their help is needed or not. So Pondy is uh, taking the one-on-one -on -one to his uh, strong side. And we see in picture nine that uh, Remy Lee has realized that Pondy has, uh, has been successful in getting Saugstrup out of his uh, uh, defense position. And that Remy Lee is also... Um, um, being successful in attracting, let's uh, say it this way, in attracting uh, Mölgard as a second central defender to help Saugstrup. Um, that is why the possibility for a crossing arises and Pondi is able to catch their attention for a long time. He can keep the ball for a long time and um, in the last moment, he gets rid of the ball, uh, playing the, cro the cross with Remili. You can see that in picture 13. And then we have the breakthrough of uh, Remili on pictures 17 uh, and a, a very good location for uh, finishing this attack and giving um, the, the French players on right back and the right wing the opportunity to do the substitution because uh, don't forget they are shorthanded. So these were uh, four examples taken out of the world championships uh, of women and men. And now let's have a look at some variations in the openings and also at some fakes. Um, I don't want to pay uh, attention to the small details I was focusing on in the picture rows. But here I provided you with more uh, video clips and QR codes so that we are a bit quicker in moving uh, through uh, those videos. So uh, all in all, we're talking about eight clips I want to show. 
Um, you can pay attention to the variations in the opening um, and the defenders who are isolated. And yeah, let's start with a clip Sweden against Portugal, um, where they uh, make this movement of a long crossing. Once again, I do not know how you call it in, in other countries. Um, but it's a movement where the left or the right back moves um, in front of the center back into uh, a central position. Um, this is um, what I normally call uh, uh, the, the beginning of a long crossing. And in the clips I decided and I uh, chose, I tried to take uh, examples of different nations uh, from different continents so that uh, we can see that this is not a phenomenon only in one place of the world, but uh, in many, many countries. So Sweden against Portugal. Uh, after this um, intro of a long crossing, we have a, a pass in return to center back, and then they are attacking number two defender. Ball across the floor, he's through, and uh, that is a tough left hand corner, good finish. We can have this clip once again because it's very short. Ball across the floor, he's through, and uh, that is a tough left hand corner, good finish. Yeah, we see Johansson uh, moving to the inside, and everything looks um, like an isolation of number three defender because. Uh, the line player of Sweden is moving away. And because um, Portugal is anticipating this isolation of number three defender, Luis Frade on uh, defense position number two um, is standing closely to that number three defender. And this opens Johansson uh, the possibility to pass the ball back to Felix Klar, who uses this space for a breakthrough and this goal for Sweden. Second variation, we're um, coming to transitions. We have already seen shifting movements, crossing uh, in the back with our ball, crossing of center back with line players. And now let's look at some transition um, of the left wing and a retransition in this um, clip. Once again, because uh, we will have some clips of Brazil, all starting with that opening. So we see uh, the Brazilian left back, Joao Silva, with number four attacking uh, Luis Frado on um, position number two. After this transition of left wing, he is um, going to his position. Uh, he is going back to his position, so playing the retransition. And at the same time, the line player starting in position between number two and three is moving away so that uh, Brazil is pretty much focusing on how to attack and how to isolate um, defenders on the half position because there you also have different opportunities for following up actions. So uh, that is why I chose the next clip as example number three for you, Portugal against Brazil. Um, now Brazil is playing the exact, exactly the same opening on the right uh, side with a transition of the right wing and a retransition. You know this opening, but you will also see uh, different following up actions now. Yeah, once again.
So as I said, the same opening, uh, the right wing is coming inside, going back to his position on right wing. And um, at the time of the pass from center back to um, right back, the line player is moving away. And uh, in this case, Rodriguez is playing the one-on-one. -on -one. He's a very strong one-on-one -on -one player. And um, he's covering Frade, who is now... Um, uh, defending on number five position. Maybe there was no time for him to substitute because, um, as you all know, he is a good good line player. Um, so he is now defending close to the bench on number five position. Um, Rodriguez is playing the one-on-one -on -one with him. And after that, uh, a crossing with uh, Joao Silva, uh, who is then able to, to solve that two-on-one -on -one situation with a pass uh, to the right wing, who's able to score for Brazil. It was a very close match in uh, the World Championship, took place in Gothenburg. Um, and yeah, very interesting if you could have a look at it afterwards. Um, we move to uh, the next match, Sweden against Portugal. And you will see exactly the same uh, story, exactly the same play uh, by Sweden against Portugal. back out to the wing here. It's nicely worked. Daniel Patterson makes no mistake out there. Beautiful work between Patterson. Johansson coming across with intent only to draw the defender. So. As well in this situation, once again, the clip starts with Pettersson being already inside before he plays the retransition. So, and as I said, pay attention to different openings. Um, to hide the target sector, maybe to create the personal constellation where you uh, can play the one-on-one -on -one against. But you see clearly the same characteristic features. Uh, the line player is moving away so, so that um, the defense can hardly cooperate. And um, they do not know in advance which sector will be attacked. Example number five, transition of the right wing. Uh, Portugal against Brazil. We already saw some clips out of this match. And again, Brazil is attacking, is attacking number five defender of Portugal with the same uh, opening, but a different following up action. I can say this at uh, this point already. Still close, 22-22. Yeah, once again, this clip. Transition and retransition. Yeah, and so a nice uh, variation of the same opening of the same one on one action, but this time no crossing of right back with center back, but left back coming um, inside, coming out of the view of the defenders. And so uh, his shot taking after the, uh, taken after the first step is really a surprise to the defense and also uh, to the goalkeeper. So some nice variations with the same opening. Um, but as I said, you can also choose a different openings uh, and still attack uh, central or half defenders. It's It depends on the approach you want to choose. Now, example number six, Germany against Argentina in the main round uh, having taken place in Poland. Here we have a crossing without the ball and isolation of number three defender. Focus there on the left wing Mertens, who's had a terrific tournament. Oh, again, 
Well, if they're not going to push up on him, he's just going to help himself all day long from there. Yeah, and this is a good opportunity for uh, players who, ha who have their strengths in uh, quick step shots uh, to receive the ball in movement, the line players moving away. We have seen the isolated space again. And um, yeah, it was comparable to uh, Mats Menza, who also uh, took the shot with a quick step shot. Uh, but it depends uh, everything on the individual skills uh, the players have and yeah an, a nice variation as well uh, example number seven is taken out of germany against serbia and here we have a combination of a transition uh, by the left wing and a retransition of that left wing while center back is playing that cross uh, with a pivot so you see um, also a combination of camouflage actions uh, can help. So uh, at the beginning, you already see uh, the left wing of Germany, Lukas Mertens, is moving inside, is playing the transition, and Knorr and Gola are preparing the uh, crossing of centre-back and line player. Two goals in it now. Still Germany short-handed with an empty goal at the other end. Hester comes in. Oh, yes. Defensively, the center is taking on water for certain. Yeah. As I said, nice, nice uh, clip with also uh, possible other following up actions. Um, this also in a very decisive moment and uh, hidden uh, for a long time, which is the tar target sector and uh, who is going to play that one-on-one. -on -one. The last example in uh, the chapter of uh, variations is taken out of Germany and Qatar. Germany was playing a lot with transition of the wings. And um, this next uh, transition of the left wing takes place in the backcourt. It's behind the backcourt players. And then uh, Lukas Mertens is also going back to his position and again uh, the central defender on number three position is isolated give him a bit of room <laughs> Supplying to him. Sublime. Yeah, and maybe you still remember the slide I uh, showed to you in uh, possible structures of isolations where uh, the line player is very, very important for this uh, isolation because he cannot only help in isolating one defender by moving away. He can also make uh, fake movements like coming back uh, Saugstrup did this in uh, the one example I showed to you, and Rasmus Lauge took this jump shot feint here. Johannes Goller is also coming back, and uh, so there is no isolation uh, necessary, but so much space to cooperate uh, center back with line player. Sublime. Yeah, now we have seen uh, some variations in the openings, um, some variations in the following up actions, and I hope you got an idea um, which strategies you might want to follow as a coach and uh, uh, that there is an uh, incredible number of um, possibilities for you and your players. Uh, but the characteristic features uh, always stay the same. And it's also important to start from the very beginning to focus on basic skills uh, when preparing your players um, at younger age categories. Um, let's take a look at some fake movements. 
um, like fake isolations, a fake retransition, or fake away movements of the line player. Uh, the first video is taken from Cap Verde against Hungary. Um, and there you will see the center back player bouncing, which is uh, a signal for the stat for a start. The pivot is make is moving away, and the center back is starting with a change of rhythm in that isolation. But he's not playing that isolation. He is passing the ball um, into the sector where uh, the line player has moved into to have a two on two situation there against the defense, which is not prepared. Let's take a look at Cap Verde against Hungary. Right, the first half, he's had a fantastic match so far. Plays that one off for Bodo into Banhidi on the line. If it wasn't going to be a goal, it'd be a penalty, but it was a goal and he sent his opposite number down as well. He stayed down as well. Landine. I think this is a very, very nice example that you can adapt your strategy or your philosophy, not only to a certain country, but uh, which is most important to the players you have. And if you have uh, strong line players like Banhidi or Rosta in, in Hungary, or if you have strong players in the backcourt, um, you can ad adapt and um, um do it like Hungary does, like opening the space for an isolation, uh, but not making use of this isolation, but making use of the strength, like uh, Banhidi uh, being uh, taller than two meters and um, being a very um, good defender, uh, attacker, which is hard to defend. So once again, Hungary against Cap Verde is moving away. But the decision is taken by Bodo on left back, who can either shoot or look for Banhidi, who has blocked um, in a very good way. So Hungary did this not only against Cap Verde, but also against Brazil, where you could also see the same play. Lekai on center back. And again, Lekai on center back is not playing the isolation, but playing into the other sector where Banhidi is already waiting in a block situation and right back can decide whether he wants to take the shot or make use of the advantage Banhidi has created. Uh, number three, a fake retransition of the left wing taken out of the match, uh, Brazil against Iceland. Yaki Ellison is going inside. Then we have the crossing center back with line. And um, most uh, um, teams uh, anticipate or expect the, the left wing to play the retransition, but Bjarki Ellison did not. And after the isolation on number three, nobody is taking care of him. And so again, um, you don't have to play the retransition, but you can uh, take advantage of that two against one. Um, Sweden against Cap Verde. We also see a fake uh, retransition of left wing as uh, a second example. Uh, you see Hampus Vane is already inside and we see the starting, uh, uh, the opening of crossing center back with the line player. After the attack that things started to flow for the Swedes. There he is in the center. Ball into the line. Great pass inside. And a deft little finish. Afrozvana with his first of the... Yeah, and everybody is expecting the one-on-one, -on -one, the isolation on number three uh, of Gottfriedsson. And you can also see, uh, if you look at it in, in detail, that Vane is um, 
moving his body uh, shortly as if he would uh, play the retransition to left wing, but that it is only a fake movement and um, in very high precision, uh, precision um, connected to um, Jim Gottfriedson. That is why they can be successful with that. They started to flow for the Swedes. There he is in the center. Ball into the line. Great pass inside. And a depth little finish. Off of Zvana with his burst of the... What I find also interesting in this clip is uh, for referees, um, if they are only focusing what's happening with ball, um, they might not focus on uh, the line and the goal area. Maybe uh, a line player or a left wing is moving uh, through the goal area. Hampus Wane does it correctly in this case, and the referees also have a look at this. Um, but this is uh, why referees should also have uh, knowledge about the game so that they can uh, pay attention to what is happening in different sectors. Uh, once in the sector where the ball is and in the other sector uh, where the line player or the wing player is waiting for movements like this. Uh, one last um, example, a uh, picture row taken out of the match Germany against Egypt, a very tough and uh, close match, um, which was decided in um, extra time, in overtime. And um, this is a fake uh, retransition, as I mentioned in um, the slides with the variations. You can see on picture one, um, Lukas Mertens as a left wing with number 36 um, has moved inside. And the Egyptian defense has reacted uh, to this transition by the German left wing that the two defenders on position number uh, two and one have moved um, outside the nine meter area so that uh, the attackers cannot uh, receive the ball in forward movement. So um, very good quality. with the uh, defenders. And then on picture three, you see Mertens is uh, going back. He is faking the retransition to the left wing position. And he is running behind the two Egyptian defenders in picture number four. Then the situation goes on. Um, I guess that the two Egyptian defenders on picture six are talking to each other and organizing themselves like a uh, half defender is playing against left back and the wing defender should go back uh, to the to the wing because they suppose Mertens to be there again. But in picture number seven, you can see many things happening at the same time. Uh, first of all, Yuri Knorr doing the long run-up with a change of rhythm. Johannes Golla at the line moving away, isolating uh, defender number three. And you also see Lukas Mertens on left wing not going back to his position, but coming back to the center. And because it would be uh, very difficult for Yuri Knorr, to uh, play with him, to cooperate with him. Uh, there's this uh, cross. They prepare this cross with Kai Hefner, uh, who as a left-hander um, is uh, in, a, in a better situation to uh, play with Lukas Mertens as um, he is a left-handed player and uh, they have uh, good connections and can, can see each other. Yeah, and this is what is what is happening. Uh, Lukas Mertens is coming back. Kai Hefner um, with a good uh, quality in this pass. Um, giving the ball to Lukas Mertens, who is able uh, to score. And this was my, my final example of uh, faking uh, isolations with different means. And uh, so I, first of all, say... Uh, Thank you for, for your attention, and now I'm open to 
to answer questions. I hope I was able to uh, get the message across and connect. Um, you've, you've really, you've really did it, uh, Johan, because we don't have many, many questions. Uh, so I think you've done a great job. So first of all, uh, how do you see the seven on six situations uh, with isolations? Um, I, I can, I can say uh, that um, I'm not, I'm not um, in favor of of a seven against uh, six in general. I'm, I'm. Uh, me myself, I'm not focusing on many tactics in uh, seven against six. I like the ver variety of handball that you have the opportunity uh, to do this. Um, but um, myself, I'm not focusing much on on a seven against six. I like the game when uh, uh, advantages are uh, looked for by winning one on one duels in preparing spaces. Um, yeah. More, I, I prefer I prefer this uh, more than uh, um, superiority already given. But I, I like the opportunity in the case of um, playing six against six. That uh, this is what I have to admit. So um, I like uh, there's there are some advantages, some disadvantages because I prefer the normal six against six than seven against six. Of course, this has been a very tactical presentation. How do you think uh, tactics have changed in handball in the last decade? I think tactics have become easier uh, on the one hand that it's uh, uh, more about where's the one-on-one, -on -one? what is the player who is, uh, who is going to play the one-on-one -on -one in um, attack and which defender do we want to attack in defense? Either we have... Uh, seeing that there is uh, one weak defender or that our strategy is attacking the half or central defenders. But on the other hand, I have to say that um, tactics have changed, that um, coaches have thought a lot uh, to, um, to make it a surprise, to, to hide uh, in which sector they are going to play the one-on-one -on -one and uh, therefore have um, the, the wing players are more involved in uh, being at the goal area, moving away, coming back. Um, so uh, tactics have developed in, it's more easier because one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two situations are looked for, but they are prepared uh, better and uh, you cannot um, um, see it from the very beginning what is going to happen. And this is what I like because this has also uh, something about being quick in your mind, taking good decisions. And I think this is um, has supported handball in becoming more and more attractive. Thank you very much, Johan, for your presentation and for your, for your answers. This is the conclusion of the 2023 IHF referees, uh, Coaches and Referees Education Week. Have a nice weekend and thank you very much for your attendance. Goodbye. Bye-bye.